and you go ahead and begin, Ryan. Thanks. Then can you um, make me a host so I can share my screen? Oh, perfect. Thank you. Mm. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning's uh, presentation is on Francis Perkins and Polly Murray, the Reverend Polly Murray. They were um, living roughly at the same time, uh, though Francis was older than Polly by a couple of decades, three decades to be exact. Um, and we're just gonna be talking about their sense of lifelong vocation. So uh, each of them has a feast day in the Episcopal Church. They are both uh, in the lesser feast and fast. Uh, and so the first collect is a collect uh, for Francis Perkins, the feast of Francis Perkins. So let us pray. Loving God, we bless your name for Francis Perkins, who in faithfulness to her baptism, envisioned the society in which all might live in health and decency. Help us following her example and in union with her prayers to contend tirelessly for justice and for the protection of all, that we may be faithful followers of Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. Liberating God, we thank you for the steadfast courage of your servant, Polly Murray, who fought long and well, unshackle us from the chains of prejudice and fear that we may show forth the reconciling love and true freedom which you revealed in your son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So Francis Perkins um, was born Fanny Coralie Perkins on April 10th, 1880. She was a contemporary of uh, Fred, uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt. She actually worked very closely with them and she met Franklin Roosevelt in 1910, the same year that Polly Murray was born. She was raised with, along with her sister in Boston in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. And she attended Mount Holyoke College and received a BA in chemistry and physics. But she actually didn't do anything with that BA because around the time that she was in uh, college, when she started college, uh, the women's suffrage, uh, the su women's suffrage movement started and she got really involved with that and became really um, influenced by progressive politics. And so she wanted to do, go into social work, but when she tried to do that in Massachusetts, um, she couldn't find a job, she couldn't find a position. And so she ended up working at Whole House in Chicago. Whole House was a house for women and children, um, namely mostly immigrants. Uh, that was started by Jane Adams, who was another person in the social gospel. Mm -hmm. And so um, she was working at Whole House, and she her of her time there, she said, "I had to do something about unnecessary hazards of life, unnecessary poverty." It was sort of up to me. One thing seemed perfectly clear. Our Lord had directed all who were following in his path to visit the widows, the orphans, the fatherless, the circumstances of the life of the people of my generation was my business. And I ought to do something about it. So she took this really seriously. And it was during her time at um, Whole House in Chicago that she also came into contact with the Episcopal Church. And so she started going to the Episcopal Church of the Holy Spirit, and she became a um, communicant there in 1907. So she graduated college in 1905 and started working at a whole house, and she became an Episcopalian in 1907. And that's really what shaped her. And so the social gospel at that time um, was a movement by mostly Anglo-Catholics that came over. Um, it started in England, in the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and came over to America. And it really influenced people um, like Francis Perkins, um, the Roosevelts, 
and if you've ever heard of her, Vita Scudder. And so they made this their kind of vocational framework in terms of making sure that people weren't living in unnecessary poverty and trying to figure out ways to um, bring some type of beauty and hope to people's lives. And so she starts, she worked at Whole House for a few years and then she ends up she looked around and saw the poverty around her and said, I need to understand this better. So she went to Wharton School of Economics and Business and got an economics and business degree um, so that she could understand how poverty works on an economic level. So she'd already seen how it affected people's lives, but she wanted to understand um, how it affected, uh, the effect it had in like a wider or a more widespread way. And so she went to school and then when she graduated, she took on a position as the head of the National Consumers League in New York. And while there, she made three things her goal. She pushed for a 54 hour work week because there were no work week limits prior to this. Um, and then she worked to eliminate child labor. That wasn't as successful as she'd hoped, but she already put in place some things, um, some policies to limit the hours in the kinds of conditions that children could work in. Because at the end of the 20th century, uh, 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century, children could work anywhere at any time uh, and in any conditions. And so children were being uh, maimed and severely injured and even dying due to just workplace hazards. And so she really wanted to eliminate that. And then she worked to legitimize labor unions. You know the history of kind of like uh, the United States at this time, the early, late, uh, late 19th and early 20th century, monopolies were really big. And so um, like kind of like those really, those tycoons that were building America who were building the, um, the railway systems and uh, building um, kind of these car uh, and auto industries. They were also trying to monopolize these in, uh, industries so that they can make more profits. But that also meant that their workers weren't, um, didn't have a lot of rights. And so people like Francis Perkins really pushed to say, labor, laborers have to be able to form unions so that they can protect themselves and, um, so that they're making money, the company's making money, but also people aren't dying of exhaustion and people aren't dying because no one's taking the time to put in the resources, the money to make sure that workplaces such as like a coal mine has uh, proper equipment. And so she was really, really affected by a particular workplace um, issue uh, in New York. So uh, in 1911, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory had a fire and 146 people died. Many of them were immigrant women and there were some children. And they died because um, as the fire started, the foremen told them to go down fire escapes, but the fire escapes, some of them were really janky. And so they pushed the fire escapes down and they fell. Uh, the fire escapes themselves fell and so they couldn't get down. So a lot of the women started jumping out of windows because they didn't want to be burned alive. But if you jump out of a window from say the third or fourth story, you're not guaranteed to, uh, to, to land well or to live. And so 146 people died. And um, Francis Perkins and some other people said, that's just not acceptable. You should be able to go to work and, and not fear for your life. And so she was on a committee that um, pushed for uh, an investigation. And in the investigation, really what they found was that if there had been working fire escapes, many of those women would not have died. And so as a part, as a result of her work on that investigation, she became the executive director of the Committee on Safety. And she pushed for workplace safety, um, regular fire drills within workplaces, working fire escapes. And then she also tried to combat wage um, discrimination because uh, for women particularly, wage discrimination was a huge issue in the workplace. And so she kind of continued in those uh, types of positions. She took some time off. She got married to a man named Paul Wilson and she had a daughter, um, but her husband had lots of mental health 
issues. And so he was in and out of sanatoriums. And so she was able to continue working and they really tried to have this like egalitarian um, relationship. So while many women of her class at the time weren't work, weren't people who went into work and definitely weren't working in politics or heading offices, she was for a variety of reasons. Um, but in 1932, Frederick Roosevelt, uh, oh, Frederick Franklin Roosevelt, who she'd known since 1910, was elected president. And he named Frances Perkins to his cabinet. And she became the first woman ever to serve on a presidential cabinet. Um, and she became the US Secretary for Labor, the Labor Secretary here. Um, and as you know, uh, in 1932, we, the United States, we were in the midst of a really bad depression, the Great Depression. And so his, uh, his inaugural speech was all about, and his campaign was all about, we are going to get this economy, the economy going again. We're going to make sure that people can eat. We're going to make sure that people have jobs. And so uh, obviously, because he was the president, FDR gets a lot of uh, credit for the formation and execution of the New Deal. But actually, as the labor secretary, Frances Perkins is the person who brought a lot of these, um, a lot of the programs that FDR pushed for, um, she brought them to his attention. And so what she, she came to him with, with, with a plan. And she said, listen, this is what we need to do. We need to have a 40 hour work week. We need to end child labor. Um, and the way she said this was, if children aren't working and they're in school, guess, who gets a job, guess who gets to replace them for that, that job? Adults who need the income. Um, and then she pushed for unemployment benefits, the unemployment insurance that we have today um, for those who lose their jobs. She, uh, it was her idea to do that. And then she also pushed for social, social security. And this one in particular, uh, she pushed for because she thought um, of the scriptural example and mandate to take care of widows and children. And so she said, listen, people die, men die, they get hurt in the workplace, and then their wives and their children are left no income, no way to, to take care of themselves. And this is not appropriate. And also as older women, older women aren't going into the workplace after their husbands die and they're not getting a pension. And so that's not okay. And so she pushed that and he pushed back on a lot of this initially and said, um, no one's going to approve this. Uh, this is scary and this is going to cost a lot of money. And she said, yes, but this is how we take care of our people. And so um, some of the, if you know, some of the kind of like what they call the alphabet soup of the New Deal, um, her direct um, influence, the things she directly influenced were the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, uh, which Polly Murray worked with for a while. Um, so uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the reason that we have such beautiful uh, state parks and national parks um, was because of the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, working to uh, create those parks. And then the Fair Labor <laughs> Um, so while she was in DC, she worshiped at St. James Episcopal Church, which is a little farther away from um, the, the, the National Mall, um, but she wanted to worship at an Anglo-Catholic church. She was very influenced by Anglo-Catholicism because of their commitment to the social gospel. So the rector there, Alfred Q. Plank, encouraged her to take a retreat in Maryland with the Society of All Saints Sisters of the Poor. It's an Anglican religious order. And uh, she liked it so much that she kept going back and she eventually became an associate of the convent and wore a white cap to indicate that she was an associate um, while she was visiting, which was pretty frequent. She went multiple times a year. Um, and her faith was a guiding principle of her work. It enabled her to do her work in what she believed was a faithful way. And that was in turn, um, and that entailed taking care of laborers, making sure that people had jobs. And then while they were at those jobs, they could uh, be safe and get a fair wage. Um, and then 
in an interview, she was interviewed a lot. She was on the cover of Time in 1933, um, right after the inauguration, because she was the first woman to serve on the cabinet. Um, and in an interview, she said uh, that she wished for a society in which people of all kinds of faiths uh, who believed in God co could cooperate. So um, she often said, you know, if Catholics want to work with me, I'll work with them. If uh, Baptists want to work with me, I'll work with them. If Jews want to work with me, I'll work with them. Whoever wants to work with me to do this work of taking care of laborers and the laboring class, I will work with them and I will cooperate with them um, because this isn't about one <clears throat> Or many. This isn't about a society, uh, a Christian society. It's about a society um, that can take care of its people. Um, so sh she lived out her vocation through a very political and um, upfront and public career, but she didn't actually openly talk about her faith. She, unlike uh, FDR, who would often say, you know, who would often often use couch his uh, speeches in biblical language or talk about being an Episcopalian or a Christian as a way of making his point, she didn't do that. And, not, and she didn't do that not because she was ashamed of her faith, but because she thought that God made each person as unique and that their faith and their faith practice reflected that uniqueness as much as anything else about them and as much as their interests, as much as their appearance. Um, and so she never wanted to uh, make someone feel that they couldn't work with her or that their viewpoint wasn't valid. She wanted everyone to bring whatever faith was pushing them into public work to feel uh, like they could do that. And so um, in the 1920s and 30s, I think that was a really, uh, that was, you know, kind of un unknown or uh, unseen at the time. And so she was very shaped by being an Episcopalian um, and, and she allowed that to kind of suffuse her work. Um, she continued, she retired in 1945. She, she was no longer the, the labor secretary, namely because FDR died in 1945, in April, 1945. Um, but then she worked under Harry S. Truman um, he asked her to head up a committee on labor, and so she did that. Did that, and then she taught um, uh, labor and government classes at a local college in New York uh, until she died. And so uh, she died May fourteenth, nineteen sixty five, and her feast day is May thirteenth in the church. So that's Frances Perkins. Um, Anna Pauline, who we know as Polly Murray was born 30 years after Frances Perkins in um, 1910, November 20th, 1910. And she was born in Baltimore, Maryland. She was raised, however, um, by her ma maternal grandparents in Durham, North Carolina. And she was raised Episcopalian. Her family was a family of faithful, Episcopi uh, faithful Episcopalians uh, pretty much from the start. Uh, and she graduated from Hunter College in New York in 1933. So as, um, Frances Perkins was becoming the uh, labor secretary. Uh, Polly Murray was graduating from college and like so many millions of other people, people for a job, a job that didn't exist. And so she uh, or they um, went, um, started working for the WPA. Um, Polly traveled exten extensively um, up and down the Eastern coast. And she was in Virginia traveling with a friend um, and she experienced some racial segregation uh, at a lunch counter and then a, um, in a train. And so that influenced her to go into law at Howard University in DC um, because she thought, how will I, how do I influence the policies and practices of our country? And how do I fight against racial segregation? And so she entered the law program at Howard University in DC. She was the only woman in her class. And the first day of her class, the, um, her, one of her law professors said, I have no idea why a woman would want to study law and join a law program. And this really angered her. Uh, angry Polly. And so Polly decided to become the top student in the class. Um, and so in several papers, she explored the intersection of race, racism and sexism, and she coined the term Jane Crow. 
to indicate that people who are living at the intersection of, uh, of being a woman and being black experience two types of, at least two types of discrimination. They experience racism by virtue of being black, but they also experience sexism even within their racial group. Um, and so she talked about that a lot. And so she also, and it began to form her and shape her to think about um, if we're fighting, if we're already fighting for racial rights and racial equality, then we should also be focusing on fighting for gender equality too, um, for women so that women aren't um, also relegated to being second class citizens. So she wrote a paper noting the consequences of Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson was um, a, a Supreme Court case in the late 1800s regarding um, train travel between the South and the North. And so uh, a man, uh, Plessy, got onto uh, a, a train in the North. And when he got to the South, uh, he had to move to a separate car. And so the ruling of that was separate but equal is fine. That's constitution constitutional. Uh, as long as there are um, equal amenities, then segregation is fine. And what Polly wrote a paper about uh, about was this study that separate is not equal, uh, and it's actually detrimental and unconstitutional. It's detrimental to the spiritual, social, um, and mental well-being of the class uh, of each class, but particularly of the kind of second class, so of Black people, of people of color who are experiencing um, racial segregation. And so, um, her teachers pushed back against that and said, "Uh." Uh, we think you're wrong. And we actually think, she said she thought Plessy v. Ferguson would be overturned within 10 years. She actually made a bet with her professor, her law school professor. Um, and I'll tell you how that bet went in a second. So she graduated at the top of her class. And at the time, students who graduated at the top of their class at, from law school at Howard University were offered uh, the chance to do postgraduate studies at Harvard University. Um, but because she was a woman, Harvard said, no, thank you. Uh, so she couldn't do that. She did end up studying at Burner College, but not at Harvard. Um, so she spent some time uh, working with the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, and she saw firsthand how segregated and unequal the camps were. And she wrote to FDR several times. And she did. She was not very kind or necessarily uh, polite in her in her letters to him, her correspondence with him. And he did not write back, but she kept writing. And so Eleanor Roosevelt was like, "Who is this young person writing to us to to kind of call my husband to task?" And so she actually struck up a friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt that lasted until Eleanor Roosevelt died in the early '60s. Um, she worked after after Polly graduated from um, Howard. She worked for the NAACP, and in 1954, um, the Supreme Court took the case of Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, and Thurgood Marshall takes Polly's paper from law school, talking about uh, how detrimental and unconstitutional separate but equal laws were and uses that to build his case against separate but equal policies. He doesn't cite Pauli in this, does not acknowledge where he got this idea. But as we know, uh, Brown v. Board overturns <laughs> the separate but equal policy and says that that's not constitutional. Separate is not equal and that segregation can't stand anymore, particularly in schools, but really it just, it makes way for segregation to end. Um, and so Polly sees her law professor a few years later and he says, I owe you some money because I lost this bet. It was overturned and how did you even know? And Polly, you know, Polly's like, because I pay attention. I pay attention to people. I study people and I know the law and I know what's good. You know, I, I can, I can see where, where the law is going. Um, and so after that, Polly, Polly starts really leaning into women's rights. She always works with, um, she works with CORE um, in Atlanta, which is a part of what um, 
Martin Luther King Jr. was doing in the South, but she also, or Polly was also appointed by JFK um, to the pres uh, Presidential Committee on the Status of Women in 1961. And as a part of that, submits a proposal arguing that the 14th Amendment actually covers sexual dis uh, sex discrimination or gender discrimination is how we'd say it now, in addition to racial discrimination. So uh, Polly says the 14th Amendment forbids discrimination based on gender in the same way that it forbids racial discrimination. And so we need to look at that. And so in 1967, um, she and another woman, can, uh, I can't remember her first name, I think Gloria Kenyon, they present a case to the Fifth Circuit uh, of Appeals, White versus Cook, and they make the argument that women have the right to serve on ju juries, and that's a successful argument. So women win the right to serve on ju juries. And then in 1977, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uses Polly's arguments in White versus Cook to help frame her closing arguments in Reed versus Reed, um, which is this, the first Supreme Court case argued by a woman, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and she cites Polly and names Polly as a co-author of that um, case. So unlike Thurgood Marshall, who just is like, I don't know where I got this wonderful language. Um, <laughs> Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, I know exactly where I got this language. I know exactly where I got the idea for this argument. It's Polly Murray. Uh, and so Polly uh, ends up being really influential. A, a lot of our laws that came out in the late 60s in the 70s and 80s regarding race, gender, and sexuality actually were, uh, came, up, came about by people going into uh, legal, the legal annals uh, and pulling out papers and arguments that Polly Murray wrote. Uh, and, and using that as a way of framing their own arguments. Uh, and so uh, if you're a woman and you have a job and you uh, get paid a decent amount of money, you have Polly Murray to thank uh, for that. Um, Polly Murray was a teacher. So uh, Polly taught at Benedict College and then Brandeis um, and mostly taught law, but also introduced uh, African-American and women's studies classes into the university system. Uh, and then in 1973, at the age of 63 years old, Polly entered General Theological Seminary and said, I've had this great life, this great vocation of seeking justice, but I want to do some different type of justice seeking, and I want to do it in the church. And so in 1976, Polly was ordained to the diaconate, and then in 1977 was ordained a priest, and was the first African-American woman um, or also the first gender non-conforming person because uh, Polly often did not uh, always claim the identity of woman um, to be ordained a priest in the Episcopal church. And um, Polly based uh, her ministry uh, with the same vocational focus that she based her, her law and teaching vocations, um, reconciliation, um, for the poor and those who are, have experienced discrimination. Polly died on July 1st, 1985 of pancreatic cancer and her feast day or Polly's feast day is July 1st. And Polly says, true community is based upon equality, mutuality and reciprocity. It affirms the richness of individual diversity, as well as the common human ties that bind us together. So um, I, I really think it's interesting that uh, a, lot of, a lot of the reasons that Polly could even work and even think about what does, uh, what does equality for women look like is because of the work that Frances Perkins was doing just a few decades. Like, just, just as a person who was only a few decades older than Polly, um, and that they're both Episcopalians. They both have relationships with the Roosevelt's who are also Episcopalians. And all four of these people really shaped um, our conversations 
around um, equality and justice um, in the workplace, but also in society. In um, FDR and in, in Eleanor in very public and open ways, and then Polly in a little less public way, but Polly was uh, pretty well known uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, and then uh, Frances Perkins in more quiet ways, but all of them really allowed their faith and their faith practice as Episcopalians to push them into this idea that people people need to have, some, there, there needs to be equality. And that if you are a person who's experiencing discrimination, that's on the larger society to try to come to terms with and take some accountability about, and then to try to fix that together, that this is something that we're all responsible for. Um, and I just think that's really important and amazing uh, work that they did. Um, so, uh, I wonder if anyone has any questions or